Thank you very much, Barbara, and the other organisers for inviting me to present. I'm really pleased to be doing this. It's great to keep academia going online. So I'm going to talk about uh, the work I've been doing on zebrafish and, and validating them as models for the study of pain, and also um, further the testing of analgesic drugs, drugs that uh, provide pain relief. So I'm going to talk about why you zebrafish in these kinds of studies, are, and of course, if we are going to use them, are they actually a valid model for the study of uh, biomedical and clinical studies? Okay. Um, and then I'll talk to you about the, the behavioral assessment of pain and analgesia in adult fish, and then the use of uh, very young larval zebrafish in these kinds of experiments. I hope you enjoy this presentation. I'm sure we all know why zebrafish are wonderful, and that's why we all use them. Um, and so I don't need to tell, tell you or sell them to you. They're amazing. And uh, they have a lot of advantages over traditional rodent models, particularly in terms of their size and the cost of doing experiments with them. And of course, that has led to many labs, not just mine, adopting zebrafish as a model for pain and nociception. So I've, uh, I look today at the number of publications between 2008 and 2016. There's literally only four publications on adults and one on larval zebrafish. However, since then, we've seen quite a growth and the number of labs using zebrafish to study pain and analgesia. Just to get some terminology correct at the start, I'll just quickly define nociception for you. It is the simple detection of a potentially painful stimulus, extremes of temperature, high mechanical stimuli, or noxious chemicals, and it's usually accompanied by a reflex withdrawal response. Now, no one would argue that uh, all animals are capable of nociception. That's very much accepted. However, pain is, is a much more of a psychological state and encompasses that negative affective component, which indicates discomfort, discomfort and suffering. And we also see long term behavioral changes after a potentially painful event and the animal's long term decision making is altered. And so Pain is, is more than just nociception. I'm going to call it pain from now on because in, in my book, I've worked on this for many years, I do think zebrafish are capable of experiencing pain. Myself and colleagues came up with a more modern definition of animal pain as distinct from human pain and, and, and generated a range of testable criteria that an animal must fulfill in order to be capable of, of perceiving pain and experiencing it. And just very briefly, we said there was two uh, main central uh, themes. One is that the whole animal response to these potentially painful events should differ from non-painful stimulation. So any changes in the animal's behavior, physiology, etc., should differ. But they should also have the sort of neural apparatus to detect potentially painful um, stimuli. So they must have nociceptors pathways to the central nervous system and altered central nervous system activity, which is very specific to these potentially painful stimuli. But for pain experience, we should really see a long term change in motivational behavior such that the animal's behavioral decision making is quite different and is affected by that potentially painful event. And what I can tell you is here is the, the table of all of these criteria and their in, in detail is that birds, the aves, amphibians and reptiles here, agnathan, the jawless fishes, and teleos, the bony fishes, cephalopods, those are um, squid, uh, octopus, etc., decapods, crustaceans, crabs, etc., and insects. And for all of these groups, what we did was we ticked if there was experiments showing that these animals fulfilled those criteria. If there was a question mark, it, it didn't mean that the, this hadn't been fulfilled, it just hasn't been done yet, so the experiments haven't been conducted. And what you can really see for fish here is that all of the boxes bar one have been ticked, and yet for birds they haven't all been ticked, amphibians. So I think that, that fish do experience in some form of pain beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, in terms of motivational change, we came up with a, a long list of, of, of different types of experiments that one could do. But what I'm just going to very quickly talk to you about, which involves analgesia, 
is paying a cost to accessing pain relief. So if the animal is willing to pay a cost to get pain relief, then that means the internal experience, the subjective experience of pain is, is a negative one that the animal seeks to reduce. And this is an experiment with zebrafish where we um, basically trained the zebrafish. We put them in a start chamber here, and then they had access to two different chambers. And then we allowed them, uh, we put them in for around 40 minutes, then allowed them 20 minutes to explore. We made one chamber enriched, so they had enrichment, they had gravel, a plant, and then they had a, a, a test show, a sort of stimulus show behind a transparent partition. And of course, zebra fish are gregarious, they like being with others. Whereas the other chamber was made unfavorable with a bright light, no enrichment, and no show of fish to see. And then in this experiment, once they've chosen one chamber six consecutive times, and I can tell you that they preferred enrichment, even though these seven-month-old zebrafish had been reared up in barren conditions, we either gave them a subcutaneous injection to the lips of a mild acetic acid or saline as a control, just physiological saline, so no pain, or acid, but gave them morphine um, as an analgesic. And then we, we gauged whether they still went into the same chamber or not. Did they seek analgesia and were they willing to pay a cost to accessing it by going in this unpreferred chamber? And just to show you some pictures of this, it's actually quite a, a large setup. What we've done is we put food dye in here to show that the, the analgesia, when we um, dissolve pain relief in the water, it doesn't escape. And we also control, control for left-right bias. So in effect, what we did is um, we effectively, in half of the acid treat fish, we put lidocaine, which has analgesic properties, into the unfavorable chamber to see if the zebrafish would switch their preference. And I'll just show you some pictures. Um, if you have fantastic eyesight, you might see that there's a zebrafish there. You can just see the, the stimulus show. And here, there's a little a ze tiny zebrafish in this barren, brightly lit chamber. And then if we have a look at a video, here we have the, the fish is here. It's really tiny. Um, you can see it swimming around. We've get, opened the doors to the chambers, so now it's making its decision to go into the enriched chamber, which it prefers. And here you can see the other fish behind here. But in this next video, basically the fish have had the pain stimulus and then lidocaine is dissolved in the unfavorable chamber. And so what we can see here is the fish has gone into the unfavorable chamber to access analgesia. So just to explain the results, this is the time spent in the chambers. Um, we have the control fish injected with saline with no lidocaine in the unfavorable chamber, so minus analgesia the control with analgesia, the acid injected fish without analgesia, acid injected with lidocaine in that unfavorable chamber, and then acid and morphine treated fish without analgesia and with analgesia. And then we have the unfavored chamber in these red bars. And so this is time spent in unfavored area and then in the favored preferred chamber. And you can see in the controls, you spend most of the time in the favored chamber. And only when you put analgesia, the lidocaine in that unfavorable chamber, do you see a switch in preference, which is significant. When you supply morphine to the pain away, you don't see that switch. So the animals are, in effect, paying a cost to accessing pain relief. So now I'd like to move on and tell you about a project which was funded by the National Centre for Three Hours in the United Kingdom on the assessment and alleviation of pain in zebrafish. And the idea was to develop an automated intelligent software monitoring tool to measure behavior and, and actually gauge when animals were displaying signs of pain and then further use that tool to test a range of analgesic drugs via immersion, so just dissolving the drugs in the tank water. So how does one go about developing an intelligent monitoring tool? tool like this? Well, I'm a biologist, so I went and collaborated with engineers at Liverpool, and in particular Joe Spencer. And what Joe had done in the past with his colleagues was develop this kind of software that was used in a geriatric care home for dementia patients. Now, they can't communicate with their carers. Um, however, by placing uh, webcams in the rooms, they could tell which patients were particularly immobile 
or which patients were particularly agitated and, and then let the carers know that these people need attention and care. Since we can't speak with fish, I thought this would be a really good idea to employ this uh, theoretical framework for developing monitoring software for zebrafish. And so that's exactly what we did. We monitored the zebrafish in, in 3D, in this case, in my lab, from cameras at the side, cameras above. We assessed behavior in individuals, pairs, and groups. And then this is just a video showing you the tracking software that we developed. You can see that this is a top view of the fish. This is the side view, and the little red dot means that it's being tracked. And then you can see real-time data acquisition and space use here on the left. And so that, in effect, allows us to um, map the behavior in real time. And what we get from that is uh, information on uh, real time behaviors and things that we can't measure, humans can't measure by eye. So it prevents human error and human bias, but we can get things like speed, distance traveled, acceleration, deceleration, braking, and so many more. And so what we did is um, we then uh, wanted to uh, identify what were the behavioral signs of pain in individual zebrafish. So when zebrafish are subject to surgeries, they're usually placed in a tank on their own to recover from that. And what we found was a healthy zebrafish continuously swims. It swims in midwater, very calm swimming with gentle turns. Whereas fish subject to a fin clip, pit tag, um, injection of acetic acid subcutaneously or muscle damage were very immobile. They used the bottom of the tank more. There were bursts of erratic swimming and some very unusual behaviors. And so this is a, an example. Um, normally I get you to assess this and get you to put your hands up and say what kind of fish this is, but of course I can't see you. Um, this fish is swimming in midwater, it's swimming continuously, making calm turns swimming around, and so in effect, that fish is um, normal, it's healthy. The next example, and the video has started, has this fish, which, as you can see, it's sitting on the bottom. It's waving its tail a lot, but not moving anyway. Um, and then, in effect, it's quite immobile. Now, that fish has had a fin clip, which is obviously done for routinely for genomic screening and in fin amputation studies. And it's done under anesthesia, but pain relief is not routinely given. Now, in the next example, we can see this fish is swimming in midwater, calm turn, swimming continuously. And that fish has been given a fin clip, but we dissolved lidocaine, a local anesthetic with analgesic properties, at five milligrams per liter in the tank water, and so the animal's behavior is more normal. And this is the kind of data that we get from uh, the, these tracking techniques. This is um, a control individual, and this is a diagram of the tank. Red dots are fast swimming, green dots are slow swimming. So controls use all of the tank. Then we see a sham-handled fish. It's been anesthetized, but nothing's been done to it using most of the tank. Then we see a fin clip fish, fish which had a pit tag inserted in the abdomen, muscle damage, and then uh, injection of 1% acetic acid. So you can see the behavior is quite dramatically different. Then we can, of course, use that tool, and we decided to use the fin clip because it shows such a profound difference. This is two hours after fin clipping. We looked at local anesthetics, lidocaine, of course, which was effective, rupivacaine, which at one mg per liter was not very effective, then a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, NSAID. So Nixon, two milligrams per liter, not very effective. Eight milligrams per liter is. And then an opioid, morphine. Uh, this um, dose, three milligrams, not effective, but the, the huge dose for eight milligrams per liter is. And so that allows us to really develop analgesic protocols for these animals, but also shows that we can actually test their efficacy and one could apply novel compounds. Then to develop the tool, we looked at really using um, chromatic analysis. First of all, we conducted a PCA, and we found that these were the three parameters that mainly explained the data, distance from, location in the tank, and amount of activity. And then it's basically chromatic analysis. It's red, green, blue, and it, it gives you a color for each fish. 
um, and we can extract that data in real time to provide uh, a, a live health status. And we've tested it in 2D and uh, blended to treatment on various other types of experiments and a, a day of public outreach at Blue Planet Aquarium. And basically, the health index assigns a value from all of these parameters. And if the, the parameter is green, it's normal. If it's OK, it's blue. If unhealthy, it's yellow. And in pink, it's abnormal. So here's a fish which has been thin clipped. And it works backwards in time. So this is the last one minute, last 10, last 20, and last 30 minutes. So this is a sham treat fish before anything was done to it, before it was anesthetized. And it's coming up as healthy. Whereas at uh, two hours afterwards and three hours afterwards, it's still coming up as healthy. Here's a pit tag fish before it's pit tagged. And what we find is it's healthy. And then for the last um, one minute, it's hyperactive. And so that can sometimes happen. So it's important that any alerts that come from this come after a 10 minute assessment to ensure it's a, a real assessment. And this is two hours, three hours after pit tagging. You can see the animal is coming up as abnormal. And this is it working. So here's the tracking. And then this is the health index. And this is going to refresh. So please keep your eyes here. And in fact, we've tracked the fish. It's normal, healthy. We've paused it. And then we've thin clipped it. And it's coming up as unhealthy. And there you see it just refreshed. And it's coming up now as abnormal. And we've published this recently and set up a website. And you can download those tools freely um, as long as you cite the paper. And I'm very pleased to say, as an idealist who wants to improve animal welfare, um, lots of people across the world are downloading the tool and I'm hoping that they will adopt it and use it. Other uh, experiments we looked at, the complexity of movement, the fractal dimension, where we um, calculated the fractal dimension of the complex swimming trajectories of zebra fish, controls, sham, uh, thin clip, slide cane, thin clip, pit tag, 1%, 5%, 10% acetic acid, so this is the behavior before, so all pretty similar, and then one to six hours afterwards. And you can see here, we've got the controls, the sham triad, and the thin clip as lidocaine. Then if we come down here, we've got 1% acetic acid, pit tag, 5% acetic acid, thin clip, and then 10% acetic acid. Um, and so you can see there's quite a dose response there. And from that, we came up with a hypothetical arbitrary pain scale um, and so we, we um, used those fractal measures and came up with sort of normal stress from uh, handling an anesthesia, then mild, moderate and severe pain. And this is kind of the first attempt to get a, a pain intensity scale for zebra fish. But of course, it needs more work. And then from all of the studies, not just mine, um, we, I put together a list of analgesics that have been tested, the doses that have been tested as and the root, so immersion, i.e. dissolved in the tank water, injected intramuscularly, IM, injected intraperitoneally, IP, um, and the doses that are affected um, and the roots that are affected. And you can see this is uh, local anesthetic, opioids, and then the NSAIDs. And there is a really good review of this in um, a, a paper I wrote with Cass Lohman in the Journal of Fish Biology, and we've also further tested flunixin and NSAID, which I just showed you is effective at 8 milligrams per litre, but pipivacaine up to 1.5 mg is not um, effective. Now, uh, usually zebrafish aren't held on their own, they're held in breeding pairs, and the only difference really is that they interact continuously. And so here are some controls, and they're just swimming around, they interact with each other. Then we have a thin clip fish here. So one of them has been thin clip. You can see again, it's sitting on the bottom, not doing very much uh, and not interacting with the other. When we did groups of zebra fish, what, what we found is that in low numbers, they do form dominance hierarchy. And we found that uh, do, it depended on the pain type. And we've seen this sort of thing in rainbow trout where being in a group does really affect the signs of pain. So this is a control group um, swimming around, <clears throat> interacting with one another, chasing one another. And then we have 10% acetic acid. And in this, this treatment, the fish always ends up at the surface uh, rather than at the bottom of the tank. But you can see the others have stayed away from it. So we tried to develop the same system for groups of zebrafish. 
and, and we could do it. Unfortunately, because you need really high resolution on the video, you can't do it in real time. So you can't do a real time assessment. So instead, myself, Joe, Ali and Helen, my master's student, put our heads together to come up with something really much simpler. And we came up with a, a way of analysing this, again, using chromatic analysis to effectively look at um, whether um, we could just take the information straight from the video frames. And that's exactly what we did. So in effect, it measures the vertical um, hue, which um, gives an idea of where the fish is vertically. Horizontal hue gives an idea of where the fish is dis distributed across the tank. Then because the fish have white bellies, you can measure light saturation as a proxy for activity. And then, of course, um, sometimes fish cluster more closely together when they um, are subject to a welfare challenge. So we can measure clustering as well. And so this gave us an, a, an idea of how close they were, how active they were, and where they were in the tank. And these were in groups of six zebra fish. We fin clipped one, three, or six fish within the group. We also did, did that again, but with lidocaine, so we provided pain relief. And then we basically found that vertical position uh, was affected. So the fish were sitting on the bottom again, and then there was a reduction in activity. So what you can see here, this is the normal vertical position before we do any treatments. This is the normal activity before any treatments are done. And then these values represent the six hours after the treatment is done. So here we have the control, we have the sham handled, um, and then down here we have one fin clip fish, three fin clip fish, and six fin clip fish. But when you uh, provide pain relief, the fish move towards the more normal position. So the closer they are to these bars, the more normal they are. And you can see it's significantly effective for one, three fish, but not for six fish. And it could be that the dose just simply isn't high enough and the fish have taken up all of the lidocaine, so we need to increase the dose. We're hoping to investigate that soon. Now, um, just to check time, I'm still OK. Um, so uh, larval zebrafish are accepted in the UK and through Europe as um, basically replacement for adult fish. And you can look at them in these, of course, up to 98 well plates. So you can do a lot of individuals at one time. And um, we are obviously subject to the three R's, as many other countries are, in terms of their guidelines and ethics and also legislation. And so if you think adults are capable of pain perception, you should consider replacing them with very young forms of zebrafish, which are not protected. And so uh, just to remind you, of course, you've just seen it, that adult fish responses are to reduce activity and pain relief prevents this change. We assessed in that, that first experiment only one fish. We could do two per day in our system. And um, we had to get home office um, project licensing and we get expected, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, administration, which I, I personally don't mind. However, if you use fish up to five days post fertilization, uh, they are not protected under legislation and you don't need that um, uh, licensing. Um, and so a lot of researchers are now using very high numbers of larval zebrafish. So the aim of this project really was to validate these uh, young forms of zebrafish as replacement in this, these kinds of studies. And then further to determine if the analgesic drugs were effective in preventing any behavioral responses. And we also looked at um, the impact of physical stress, um, I don't know, um, You'll be very happy about me calling it fear and anxiety, but we looked at uh, pre anti predator cues and we looked at anxiety causing drugs. And uh, this, in this case, again, we developed our own system, which is pretty cheap. We used uh, 25 well plates, and I think there is some work showing that these very small 96 well plates actually um, constrain the behavior. So we had a much bigger arena to look at. And our software automatically detects the fish. And here's just an example, this 25 well plate with our zebra fish swimming around spontaneously. And so they're just under five days post fertilization. 
And again, we can measure behaviours that we can't buy eye, velocity, acceleration, time spent active, thigmotaxis is a, a, is a sort of anxiety measure where um, they spend time hugging the walls. Um, and in effect, this software um, can basically extract all this wonderful data for us, which is great. So what we did is we selected these uh, young forms at random, placed them in the well plate, um, and placed them in our apparatus, gave them 30 minutes to recover, recorded pre-treatment behavior, applied um, a, a chemical stimulus or a heat stimulus, um, and then looked at their pre-treatment behavior. And these are on top of an infrared panel, so we used an infrared camera. And so this is what it looks like. This was work done by um, a postdoc of mine, Javier Lopez Luna. And in effect, this is in a tank and we can flush water in and out and we can control temperature. So it's quite a good setup. And the camera's here up above. Um, and so this is the well plate floating in here. And that's the infrared um, panel. So what we did is we exposed them to noxious stimuli, potentially painful stimuli, uh, noxious chemicals, high temperature and cold temperatures, carbon dioxide infused water, and then we looked at a range of analgesics. And, and just to let you know that the, the, the larvae responded in exactly the same way as the adults, they reduced their activity and analgesics prevented this. And then we wanted to see if these responses were specific to nociception or pain. So we applied um, alarm substance, air immersion and uh, caffeine but also um, anxiolytic drugs and uh, gazepam to, to look at the interplay between pain, fear and stress. And so here's um, a, a, an example of a well plate, see all these yellow lines, all the spontaneous movement um, before we did anything. And then we added 0.1% acetic acid and you can see there's a dramatic reduction. And this is the change in activity. Here's the controls from before to after, a slight increase, 0.01% we get a slight increase, but not significantly so. And really, the threshold for that reduction activity is 0.1% acetic acid. You see with 0.25%, point, it's a little bit lower, but not significantly so. So we decided this was the threshold. And then we looked at the impact of different analgesics. So we have a control which was disturbed and had water flushed through, an undisturbed control, um, acetic acid at 0.1%, so you see that decline in activity. Um, so this is an increase in activity, and here's a decrease. Morphine um, at one milligram per litre or 48. Sorry, I've missed aspirin at one milligram per litre or 2.5. Lidocaine at one or five milligrams, and flunixin at eight or 20. Um, and what we found was that aspirin at 2.5 here, um, morphine, um, lidocaine at five were successful in preventing that decrease in activity, whereas flunixin at both doses were not. And then we looked at other stimuli. So here we've got exposure to acetic acid, acetic acid and lidocaine. Then we have air immersion and we see that with this physical stress, we see a reduction more so than the acid. Then with alarm substance, we see an even greater reduction in activity. However, if you prevent cortisol production by using etomidate, we don't see that drop in air, air immersed fish. And if you do air immersion before acid treatment, we get no change in behavior, similarly to an alarm substance. And we think this is evidence for stress-induced analgesia. And just to show you that diazepam and uh, anxiolytic um, reduces this response to alarm substance as well. So, um, that's quite interesting stuff and does indeed validate the replacement of adults with these um, less than five day old fish. Um, they respond to a range of drugs and stimuli um, and um, we can use them to test the efficacy of different analgesics and of course novel compounds. Um, one could ask the question of course if they're behaving in the same way as adults should we be protecting them um, but that's a question probably for another time. Um, the only thing I will say is that when we went to publish this work, um, the reviewers thought that each plate was a sample size of one rather than 25 fish. So we had to use quite a large number of larvae. Um, and um, we could do it all throughout the time of day. We did a lot of work on, on um, time of day impacts on the behavior. So that was a really successful project. And you can then use larvae as a fish 
for these types of experiments. So I hope I've shown you that um, zebrafish adults and larvae are valid, robust research models for studying nociception and pain and, and very interestingly so, and that we could use them to test novel compounds. Um, the second reason why I study this kind of work is that I'm really interested in the evolution of nociception in pain in animals. And actually all of the work I've done on fish has shown that it's, that it's highly evolutionary conserved. And actually, so the fish are a relevant model because they're strikingly similar to mammals and their, their responses to nociception and pain. And finally, I also am very interested in proving welfare of experimental animals and being able to assess and detect pain is a, a, an important refinement, as well as alleviating or minimizing pain by providing pain relief. So the data could be used to first detect pain and secondly, re improve welfare by reducing pain using analgesic. And of course, if, if you do any invasive experiments, it could be that you're actually recording responses to pain rather than responses to treatment. So it would be in your interest to reduce pain and employ analgesic drugs. And so I've written about pain being a possible confounding factor. If you're not interested in pain per se, you should really try and minimize it. So just to thank loads and loads of people, funding bodies, collaborators, researchers, um, and also um, Javier, who did the larval work, um, just to thank all of those people in the funding bodies for um, doing all this wonderful work. And of course, thanks to you for watching and thank you very much to the fishes because they're the ones that undergo all these experiments. Thank you very much.